I couldn't be more excited than to introduce the first partner this evening. What an honor. Um, she is a mom of four young children, a, um, a very well-known advocate for gender equality, and a, um, a, a film writer, an award-winning um, film writer, and we're so happy to have her here today. She's also a new Sacramento resident, so welcome to Sacramento and to our fair city. We're so happy to have you here. Um, this is Women's History Month, and on Monday, Women's History Month was launched at the Capitol with the Women's Caucus. And at that event, the speaker was our first partner. And um, her speech was so compelling and so powerful, I wanted to read just a short piece of it to give you an idea of how powerful her, her, her composure and her writing and her delivery is with regard to a speech like this. And I won't say it as well as she does, but I'm gonna give it my best. One thing has become clear above all else, the fight for gender equality is central to creating a better future for everyone. Why? Because women matter. Our voices are important and valuable. Our experiences are unique and must be listened to and believed. And when our voices and experiences are valued and when our needs, not just my needs, but the needs of black women, Latina women, Native women, Asian women, LGBTQ women, all women are listened to and prioritized. And when a plurality of diverse women have seats at the table of power, tables of power, entire families, communities, and our society is better off. That's pretty powerful stuff, and we're gonna hear more about that today. We're also um, welcoming to the stage, or back to the stage tonight, um, our good friend Karen Breslau, who we've missed for the last year. She was the moderator for seven years for She Shares, and um, she took a break, haha, -ha, break, um, where she went off to write a book and organize her own firm. And she's back now to, to do this uh, uh, conversation with the first partner. So with that, please join me in welcoming both the first partner and Karen Breslau to the stage. First partner, <laughs> welcome back to She Shares. Thank you. Jennifer Siebel Newsom has another name too, and um, she deserves a standing ovation because I just found out that this family of six is living out of boxes still um, <laughs> and um, doing some really important public work on behalf of all Californians while also running a big and young family. So, yes. hooray, that, that deserves a standing ovation. Thank you. <laughs> So a lot has changed in your life um, since you were last our guest a few years ago. Um, and I want to start with your new role. Uh, now when I think about the term first lady, and I'm not referring to a person, but rather that, that dainty little term, I yes. think of like um, hairspray and pearls mm. and crossed ankles yeah. Yeah. and um, that kind of, yeah. <laughs> That kind of, um, that stiff, uh, forced smile that yeah. we see so often. And when I think about a first partner, I don't have an image mm. yet. Right. And I'm wondering, when you chose this title, what were you thinking? What, 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 is, what is it you want to signal and show us as possible um, in public life? Uh, great question. Um, so, first of all, thank you all for being here. This is um, a real honor and a wonderful welcome. So thank you so much, and thank you to the She Shares family. You guys, I had so much fun with you a few years ago. So this is a real treat to be back with you, Karen. Thank you. Um, so really, with First Partner, I wanted to continue the work that we have been doing at the Representation Project, which is basically deconstructing stereotypes. Um, in particular, gender stereotypes. And I felt like lady um, was sort of a backwards connotation of who we really are 
as wives, as partners, as spouses. Second of all, I really wanted to expand um, the notion of who can be governor. You know, we're going to have a female governor someday. We're going to have an, yes. <laughs> We're going to have LGB an LGBTQ um, governor someday. So I wanted to expand what is possible um, for that uh, vision. And, and lastly, you know, partner to me is a reminder that none of us got here on our own. Like I'm here today because of so many people who have helped me, who have supported me, just as my husband's where he is today because of the village of love and support behind him. So I really wanted to. Um, to put into people's thinking that at the end of the day, leadership is about partnership. And while I'm not the only partner, or maybe I'm the first partner, um, you know, it's about partnership. It's not about the one man on the white horse rescuing all of us. It's really about all of us rolling up our sleeves together and partnering. And so that's really what First Partner is all about. And we actually got a vivid display of the family partnership yes. on Inauguration Day. <laughs> yes. um, and so many Californians, and I think people around the country, were introduced to your beautiful family for a moment that anybody who has tried to make it through a conference call from home can relate to. <laughs> Or do a BBC interview, I mean, you know, this, this, top, this top that even, but right. um, it was the cameo by your youngest uh, Dutch during, gotcha. uh, during the governor's inaugural address. Yes. And if you haven't seen it, you can actually, I mean, I don't think anybody hasn't seen it, but you can Google <laughs> Dutch Newsome pacifier. And I'm thinking, oh my God, by the time he's in middle school, you've got it, like, right. erase that. But um, <laughs> what, what was going through your mind uh, during these moments? Um, um. <laughs> <laughs> like, oops, I should, uh, who, who was yeah. supposed to get the sitter? Yeah. Or, uh, I mean, what, at what one point I was thinking that my, my mother was probably going, Jennifer, what kind of a mother are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mm. was so touched. I, I honestly, I'm going to be honest here, I fell in love with my husband in a moment of watching he and Dutch, who I, I mean, I'm so in love with them both, but there was this moment, you know, when, you're, when you see your, your partner exhibit that kind of emotion and love to one of your children, and to me, it's so touching, it's so moving, and I really was like, whoa. It was such a beautiful moment, just for me. I, I, you all got to witness it, but I really was like, wowed by it. It was really sweet and endearing. Um, and then there was, I was nervous, especially when, our number two, Hunter, the seven-year-old, um, he was actually trying to help get Dutch off the stage, but during the oath of office, he was tapping on the mic, and I kept being like, stop it, stop it, stop it, <laughs> while I was smiling. <laughs> there's a, there's a picture. I know, I went, Now I, was I get like, it. Okay, now and I get so it. And so I okay. thought, I was yeah. like, oh my God, what is Hunter trying to do? Like, that we're going to have a zoo fest, and everyone's going to be like, that working mom is the worst mom. You know, I had all of those, I had that run through uh -huh. my head, that yeah. anxiety of being judged. Um, but I also just, I mean, I'm so in love with uh, our family as so many of us are in love with our families that um, mm. it, was a, it was just a really special moment. Eventually though, I realized I had to get him off the stage and um, I was a little bit nervous because I knew there was going to be some screaming. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I do think the image of the governor holding yeah. his son in his arms with a blanket draped over his suit jacket and a binky in his ear, which must be hard when you're like trying to read the teleprompter and you've got feedback and somebody's yeah. sucking in here. And I just thought, wow, that, that's yeah. partnership, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's no, just that like, oops, yeah. that's the way it goes some days, yeah. right? And, and it, of course, yeah. I, yeah, and of course I was like, why did I not take the passy away before we entered? Because he would have screamed, <laughs> the right? Yeah. Right, no, exactly, yeah. yeah. Now, <laughs> you have um, talked about the focus of your work, mm -hmm. both as a filmmaker, uh, uh, a very respected filmmaker, and his first partner as cultural change. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? So cultural change, to me, um, stems from attitudinal behavioral shifts that we take individually mm -hmm. and as a community. And I, I, I feel like we were kind of out early with that term. I mean, I don't feel like people were really paying attention to the culture that was creeping up on us and sending narrative, a narrative to our children at the earliest of ages that their value as a woman lied in their youth, beauty, and sexuality, and as a boy that their value lied in power, dominance, and aggression. And so we've created this culture, whether it's a, you know, you know, pornographic mainstream culture or a hyper-violent mainstream culture, but we've created a culture um, whereby these 
you know, limiting gender norms, these hyper-masculine and hyper-feminine gender norms have, are um, becoming normalized. And so cultural change to me was about deconstructing them and really kind of saying they're not normal, they're not healthy, they're not what it is to be human. They're extremes, they're part of this marketing scheme to get us to buy products um, and to feel bad about ourselves so we buy more of those products um, or to preserve power and control in the hands of the few versus the many. Um, and so that's kind of why cultural change is so important to me because I, you know, it's, it's what, um, it's, it's, it's how we all move and breathe in our, in our daily lives is through this culture. But again, we create it, and therefore we can recreate it. And, and that's, that's a really important notion to me. We have to remember that we've created this, so therefore we can recreate it. It is not natural. It's human made. So you describe the mission of the Office of First Partner as, as breaking down gender stereotypes. Now, California is the fifth largest economy in the world, and Tina alluded to this a bit in your Women's Caucus speech, but you gave great importance, you and the governor gave great importance to, the, to this idea, uh, you know, both in terms of its impact on the social structure, but also on the economy right. of California. Yes. So could you tell us more about the yes. reasoning. Yeah, well, look, I'm finishing up our third documentary called The Great American Lie, which looks at our hyper-masculine values that we've sort of embraced and uplifted in America um, at the expense of these more um, the values that we attribute with femininity, like care, empathy, and compassion or collaboration. And the, the, there's sort of, we live in this masculinized culture. Um, and so by emphasizing deconstructing these, you know, these, ge these gendered values and the, like recreating the culture that we live in, it's really for me about uplifting the feminine. It's about uplifting care and empathy and collaboration and this notion that we're all in this together, that a rising tide lifts all boats, that it's not about, you know, win at all costs model. It's not about competition at the expense of recognizing our togetherness or our interdependence. It's really mm -hmm. about um, the way forward as a society and as a community is about uplifting what ultimately makes us human, which is empathy and care um, and helping those who are less fortunate than us. You know, because we have to remember that in California, we're both the richest and the poorest state right. in the nation. We have a lot of work to do to address social and economic immobility in this state. Obviously, it's across the country, but it's very prevalent and very, um, I mean, you walk out of a building and you see, you know, homeless um, individuals. You, you see it, and even if some of it is, is, is not there right in front of you, it's a very, it's a, we have a big problem in California, and so, really kind of getting to the root cause of this, it, for me, and, and Gavin understands this as well, is it's about our values, right? Mm -hmm. Are we gonna be a society that just privileges the few, um, which is a very hyper-masculine society, or are we gonna be a society that lifts everybody up, and which is, you know, a, a more communal model, a more feminine model, it's just a more human model. And, and in order to make that kind of a progress, we have to really see through systemic change. But again, the systemic change can only happen when we lift everybody up. And, and what you're talking about, what I hear is unlocking human potential. Yes. I mean, it, 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 there's a you know, benevolent, you know, altruistic, you know, good human impulse there, but it also unlocks economic potential, yes. right? When people are educated, when they have health care, when they have transportation, yes. and they can be productive. Yes. And pay taxes. Yes. And Gavin, you know, his focus on early childhood and starting at the beginning is something that I'm, makes so much sense and I'm so proud of, you know, addressing the readiness gap, not just the opportunity gap or the achievement gap, but really the readiness gap. You know, it starts with care, right? It's in the beginning. You start with women, prenatal care, caring for women at their earliest of stages in their pregnancies, and then making sure that you know, when the baby's born, those women are cared for, those babies are cared for, those babies get the best first start in life. Um, they're read to, they're supported, they're nurtured, they're fed well, they're, um, they're loved. All the things, it's, it's the care realm, right? It's like the care economy. We have to reinvest in the care economy, which again is 
it has been an economy that's been relegated more towards, you know, women have played roles or immigrants have played roles, communities of colors have played roles in that economy. But we have to uplift that economy because that economy is what we believe is going to fix so many right, of our problems. It's been horribly devalued. Yes, it's right? been horribly devalued. Yeah. So it sounds an awful lot like socialism. Sure. <laughs> I was saying that and I was thinking, you know, you're going to say that, aren't you? Right. Um, well, I do think the pendulum swings, right? I think um, what's kind of the time that we're living in right now, you look at the person that we have in the White House um, and the administration's, you know, hyper-masculine, aggressive values. Mm -hmm. And I think we're reacting to that. I mean, he, you know, in some sense, I, I look at the administration and Trump in particular as mirroring back to us our cultural values. And, and so I do think the pendulum is, wants to swing back. You know, it'd be nice to be in the middle. But I think, you know, historically, if you look at history, the pendulum kind of swings a bit and we react. <laughs> um, and I do think, though, that there needs to be more care because you know, supposedly Plutarch was quoted as saying sort of the end of civilization as we know it um, is when you have such extreme gaps between the haves and have nots. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like we don't have, we can't dance around this anymore. We have to recognize that if we don't care for each other, if we don't recognize mm -hmm. our common humanity, we are going to be in trouble and we are going, it's only going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Like many others, and you haven't been shy here, um, you, you were crushed by the outcome of the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. And I uh, Still also am. am yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> um, but we have really seen epic change in a very short time. I mean, I, I know there's a long way to go, but we had Trump's election in 2016, followed uh, by the women's marches, mm -hmm. uh, literally within 24 hours yes. of the inauguration, followed by the Me Too movement uh, in 2017, the record-breaking number of women who won elective office in, in last year's midterms, and now the record-breaking number of women who yes. are running for president in 2020. And I'm wondering if, like in some paradoxical way, uh, you know, has the Trump presidency unleashed um, a productive backlash or a swing of the pendulum that maybe would not have happened otherwise. Yes. I, I, I think, I mean, uh -uh. I think in some ways that Hillary Clinton um, was sort of the sacrificial lamb mm -hmm. um, to awaken us to our power and potential as women um, mm. and to incite sort of this furor and this courage to step up and step in and demand seats at the tables of power. And it's a beautiful thing. And we're not going back. The genie cannot be put back in that bottle, um, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, there will continue to be backlashes to women's progress, because there have been. Um, there will continue to be women who themselves don't believe um, that believe in sort of a woman being president mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. women having you know seats at the most powerful tables mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's conditioning and that's sort of socialization and that's stuff that I hope we can continue to overcome as a broader society uh, that'll just take time and effort and unity on our part to demonstrate what's possible when you have more of the feminine in leadership when you have a more balance right because we're a country that's out of balance and we've been out mm -hmm. of balance for a really long time and we were founded um, by a community that was not in balance. You know, we were founded, I was just back in Washington, D.C., I'm sitting on, the, I have the wonderful privilege of sitting on the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. It's a bipartisan commission, and uh, I had the wonderful privilege of um, touring some museums that I hadn't been to in a while yeah. while I was out there, and, and also just in working on our film, just being reminded of our founding fathers um, who, didn't just see slaves as property, but also saw women as property, and, and who were not willing to relinquish um, the vote to women over a long time period, um, and, and the, the you know, historic fight to uh, preserve their power and their privilege um, at the expense of all of us rising together. Um, so, you know, it's, just, it's an interesting time in history, and I, I um, do feel that, that we women 
are in a wonderful place, um, but that, to your point, there will be some hard fought battles in front of us. And I think that's pretty obvious to all of you in the room. Right, and, and we're living through one of those moments when we're 18 months into the Me Too mm -hmm. movement, and I kind of feel like there has to, I mean, there was a, there's awareness, there's visibility, what was unseen or unspoken about is now seen and spoken about. We've seen powerful men fall. We can quibble about, you know, uh, due process or the lack thereof, yes. uh, you know, certainly in some cases, that's a legitimate uh, criticism, but I feel like there should be a hashtag that's like, what's different? Uh -huh. What's really different? Uh -huh. yeah. In terms of public policy, in terms of workplace culture, in terms of um, you know, our lives, where, where does this movement need to go? Well, I, I don't know, maybe I'm naive because we're here in California with this, um, you know, I think there's so much hope in California right now. And I look around, I mean, we were, I was with um, quite a few female representatives from the, from the legislature uh, who were all basically standing up to Trump with the legislation, um, with the lawsuit um, basically attacking uh, the administration for tampering with Title X. And uh, could we just stop and define Title X for people who are not? <laughs> Can we stop it? Well, well, basically, if those of you, so, so the administration is basically trying to, I mean, it's the gag rule, right? Like, they're basically trying to say that they can take funding away from organizations like Planned Parenthood and other community clinics that in any way insinuate or, or suggest that a woman should have an abortion. So um, all of these women, so the hope I have, and the reason I'm so optimistic is because you had, you know, um, the Attorney General and all of these women, and, and obviously my husband supporting this as well, um, basically saying, you know, this is, this is wrong, you cannot, you're basically harming women everywhere, and the women and men of California have, you know, the backs of women across this country. Um, and so I guess I just really feel like we're in a time right now where, you know, California has this incredible opportunity, but also a responsibility to lead the country um, and to show what's possible and to demonstrate what it's like to have the feminine in leadership. I mean, it's, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but um, over 72% of the horseshoe, right, the governor's main office area, um, is comprised of women, right? That's, a, that's and that's the, and we just we should hammer home the fifth largest economy the, in the world. Yes. Is, I mean, that's three quarters, basically. Over 72%. Yeah, that's and a lot of. There's a, a lot, lot of, of there are a lot of yeah. working moms mm -hmm. in there. There are women of all backgrounds and walks of life. And there are incredible feminist men, humanist men in, in that um, arena, too, and in the various other positions throughout the administration. So we, I think we're leading with, whether you want to call it the feminine or the human, we're leading with empathy, we're leading with compassion, we're leading with this recognition that we have a responsibility to stand up to the Trump agenda and the Trump administration, which is hateful and bigoted and um, racist and misogynist and all those things, while also leading with compassion and empathy and recognizing that we have this incredible opportunity to lift entire communities up. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, I don't know. I, I have to be hopeful, otherwise I wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny, you mentioned California values and um, uh, we hear this a lot in, uh, in politics, like, you know, California values, <laughs> San Francisco values, um, and Ted Cruz, uh, uh, during the, actually it was just the midterms last fall, um, he referred uh, this way to California values, and he was talking about the Democrats, he said, they want us to be just like California, right down to tofu and silicon and dyed hair. Um, 
Uh, now, uh, uh, there was, uh, there's always, you know, there's San Francisco values, you know, wink, wink, you know what that yeah. means, <laughs> New York values. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the insinuation, of course, is that there's something like nefarious and, and un-American going on. <laughs> um, but w w what do you want people to think about when they think, you talked about humanism, but when they think of California values, um, what's, what's, what's the image? To me, it's, it's, it's empathy, it's a recognition of our common humanity, it's this oneness, it's mm -hmm. unity, it's the feminine, it's family values. I'm kind of tired of, I, look, I was raised in a conservative household, so this is not, I'm not trying to be partisan here, but I'm tired of the You're conservatives not? saying that they're <laughs> the, you know, the party of family values. Mm -hmm. Like, we're family, but we also sometimes choose the family that we're born into, you know, rather than just being born into a family. We get to choose our family. And our family is expansive. It's not, you know, we care about the kid that goes to school, that, that, you know, is in the lunch program, whose parent isn't there to pick him up after school because, his mom is working three jobs and she's a single mom. Like, we care about the kid that's been in and out of the foster system or in and out of, um, you know, the, the, the local sort of um, juvenile detention center. Like, we, we, we're, I think we're a caring community. You know, not all of us, we're not perfect, but I think that we, we also, I mean, as Gavin has always articulated when he was mayor of San Francisco and then as lieutenant governor and, and during the campaign, it's like we're one of the most diverse communities and we've learned to live together despite all of our differences. And we're imperfect. I know that. We have a lot of work to do. I'm well aware of the work that we have to do. But I'm really proud of our ability to live and work and thrive together and work towards the common goal of uplifting everyone. I mean, again, look, there are haters out there. We've already had, you know, feces thrown onto the lawn of the governor's mansion and hypodermic needles. And, you know, kids have told my son that his parents hate my dad. And I've even had worse things said to him about, you know, harming my husband. Like, it's not, there's, it's, there's not, we're not perfect, but we, we have potential and I feel like we lead with love and empathy and if we continue to try to lead with connection and relationship and empathy and love that we can show the rest of the country what's possible and I think the country's really looking to us to lead. Yeah. I, I, yeah we do, we live in this really tribal, uh, society, society, and and I think it predates the Trump presidency, and yes. I think it predates Fox News, and I think it predates, um, you know, the the dark web. I, it's mm -hmm. always been there. I think we just it's just more in our faces mm -hmm. and on our screens mm -hmm. and on your lawn. And I'm really sorry about that. No, um, it's okay. But. Um, <laughs> You it's grew really, I'm like, really? That's really low. That's pretty gross, yeah. <laughs> Don't you have anything better to do? <laughs> um, you grew up in a Republican family that revered Ronald Reagan, and I think at one point you were a registered Republican? Uh, yeah. Independent? Re Republican? And then independent. And then independent, and then Democrat. And then decline state. A decline, okay, yeah. <laughs> like many Californians, right? Um, and now are you a Democrat? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm so proud. Because then that would be a, that would, that would like, that would rough up that partnership pretty bad. Oh, no, um, I'm so <laughs> but, um, I'm so proud. I, I'm kind of curious about, like, like could you take us on a little fly on the wall tour of Thanksgiving at the Siebel's. <laughs> um, you know, what do you agree on and what do you argue about? Well, when my husband was legalizing marijuana, my father was like apoplectic. <laughs> because my dad coached us all in basketball and he just, you know, had a, you know, a story mm -hmm. of a gal who, you know, just kind of lost her way, right? And, but it had to do with more than just that. But he, you know, came from his, he has a perspective and, um, and, and look, I've been, what, I, what I've learned um, from my family um, is that, and I think this is what Fox News is really good at, and they call it sort of like the Fox News effect, but it's of instilling fear in the minds of those who are consumed by that kind of media. And, you know, doing things like sexualizing women and kind of um, putting, you know, Doing, playing into stereotypes that are harmful, but they, you know, so they can grab the attention of the viewer. 
Um, but that whole fear-mongering component, um, you know, it's very prevalent in, in, in many conservative households. And, and with that comes judgment. And, you know, it's dangerous. So I've learned that I'm not allowed to say anything, and I delete every email that comes my way from my father. <laughs> Does he write in all politics. caps, like so many dads? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's yeah. so sweet. I love my dad so much. But I just, the company that he keeps on the, you know, when it comes to sort of the online company that he keeps, I'm like, who are these crazy people? Gavin's always like, Ken, that's not legitimate news. <laughs> you know? um, I mean, it's like worse than Breitbart. But, uh, the good news is, you know, I used to be the, like, sacrificial lamb, and then I learned it wasn't doing anything for my relationship with my family, and so now my brother-in-laws do that for me, <laughs> um, and I smile. Um, and my husband is actually fabulous at the dinner table uh, because he's so good at speaking, um, kind of staying in the middle and, and hearing both sides, and then very kindly and gently educating you know, my father. <laughs> or putting the baby down for a nap. Or <laughs> Oops, but, gotta go. Yeah. But it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. So the movie that we're making, we have um, a gentleman who voted. One, we follow five characters across the, the country. Um, one is a steel mill worker who ends up voting for Trump. And another is a conservative w woman from the South who was really raised in kind of a bigoted household and um, was a big Reagan, you know, um, fan, and also voted for Trump. And so it, it's been really, it was really interesting spending a lot of time in the South and, and also with some of these uh, mill workers who were, who on the mill worker case had flipped and voted uh, conservatively, um, but in the South who, you know, had just such a different perspective. So it was, so really, I've, I've enjoyed it because it helps, it's helped me to understand um, a little bit more of my own family, um, but also to understand those who, you know, did not vote for Hillary Clinton um, and where they're coming from. And not that I agree with them, but um, I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to spend time with them. What should people in liberal households no, I mean you, you talked about you know the, the the Fox News effect and 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 what you hear um, you know in 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 your parents' home, but um, you know for somebody who like watches Rachel Maddow and, and you know I, <laughs> I love Rachel uh, Maddow. you know whatever but 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 you know what I'm hero. saying but but you know yeah. somebody who's like you know yeah. getting their you know their vegan Grubhub and watching yeah. Rachel what, what should people know about well, the lives about the lives of people. In, other par in the other, other tribe, prices, right. who yeah. are their fellow Americans or that, fellow Californians. Exactly. I mean, part of it is it's conditioning, right? Mm -hmm. It's socialization. Mm -hmm. It's how were they raised? Were their parents sort of, you know, um, were, were, were their parents um, authoritarian? Were they bigoted? Were they... Um, loving, were they nurturing? Um, what are their what is their financial situation? Mm -hmm. You know, the the steel mill worker. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when the mills shut down, he had no financial opportunity, and right. however many years later, he is still struggling to make ends meet. And now his sons are struggling to make ends meet, and they refuse to leave this small community in Ohio because they're all there together. But there's no you know, prosperity there. There's there's little hope. There's mm -hmm. a lot of despair. So you just, it's just putting yourself in other people's shoes and having compassion and also trying to needle them with like, you know, a little bit of education about where you come from so that mm -hmm. you can try and kind of meet in the middle. Um, I mean, at the end, end of the day, I think we have to tell each other our stories and listen to each other's stories and try and find common ground. Um, and, you know, my father and my husband actually have a lot of common ground. Mm -hmm. It's just those weird emails. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so it's really about finding common ground and recognizing our humanity in each other and and also speaking out mm -hmm. when there, you know, I had a conversation with this mm -hmm. one um, 
woman in, in the South who was um, bigoted and, you know, and I, and part of it was that she hadn't ever had a relationship with a, a, with a woman that wasn't like herself. Mm -hmm. And part of it's, you know, breaking down all of this sort of divides that separate us, that keep us from seeing each other, from hearing each other, from connecting um, on that, in that relational way. And I think if we can do more of that, and also out and acknowledge the you know, past oppressions in history that has held entire communities back um, and work towards healing those and addressing you know, the, the, the outcome of those um, historic oppressions and, and, and failures in our country. I mean, I mean we, we have a lot of work to do, but I, but I guess we have to start taking steps in that direction and we have to break bread and we have to come together um, if we're going to make any progress. That, that's what I'm wondering about because it, it, you know there is the nutty there there is the e you know there are the emails and the crazy stuff yeah. and the um, uh, I mean when I think about um, you know President Obama and the birth certificate and then um, Elizabeth Warren is like here's my cheek swab you know and then uh, now they're questioning uh, Kamala Harris's you know DNA it's it's, it's it is, it's tribal. It's, it's tribal. It, it is, is very, very disturbing on so many levels. And yeah, there's some, you know, yeah, there's mockery. And, and, but but it, it, there's also a really serious issue here, which I think you touched on, which is, you know, at this, in this era of tribalism and mockery and disrespect and people being mean to your children right. and throwing stuff on your lawn, you know, how, how do we... Um, how do we be nicer to each other? It's, it's as basic as that. And how yeah. do we, you know, how do we hear the the experience of the steel worker or the the GM plant that just shut today, right, or yesterday? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, thousands of people. Um, so yeah. I mean, it starts at the beginning. Children um, copy what they know. They model what they know um, as parents, you know, we have to, obviously, we have to play a role in, in, in socializing them in a way where they are kind and decent and respectful, um, just as, I, I think the media has been incredibly harmful to our children, mm -hmm. um, just in terms of the narrative of um, violence and domination and hypersexualization. Um, so I, have to, I think we have to look at the media. I think we have to look at social media. I mean, I, I do think we haven't really studied the long-term longitudinal, longitudinal impact of, um, of, of technology. Um, it's bringing us together, but it's also dividing us. Uh, it's it's yeah. not good. I, I find it quite dangerous. I, I worry for not just my children's generation, but the generations above of, of children that have literally been raised looking down and not in relationship with others. Yeah. I mean, I think we really have a public health crisis when it comes to that, and it's something that I want to really look into. Um, Next film? <laughs> in your spare time? Yeah, in all of um, our spare time. No, uh, uh, I know we want to open this up, and then we're running a little short on time, so I have one last um, question, and that's a chance for the first partner to set the record straight. Mm -hmm. um, speaking at the Conservative Political Action Conference in D.C. last weekend, President Trump described a phone call he said he had with your husband. <laughs> His best friend. The dialogue went like this. I just want to tell you, you're a great president and you're one of the smartest people I've ever met. <laughs> said Gavin Newsom, according to Donald Trump. That's what he said. Will he admit it? No, I doubt it. Then the president went on and he did start talking in all fairness about additional money for fire relief. Uh, we have great talks, I like him. <laughs> Over to you, first partner. <laughs> I think we all know that President Trump is the master manipulator of the truth. Are you saying this didn't happen? Well, let me tell you. Um, no, I, you know, I, they spent some time together um, and <laughs> actually, POTUS 
and he were on Air Force One and mm -hmm. called me, and I'm really glad I didn't pick up the phone. Uh, no, I, you know, look, Gavin's nice to everyone, and that's all I can say about that. <laughs> okay. Um, with that, I think uh, people have so many questions. We could talk all night and just, yeah, just keep going, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop. And um, I know that... Um, uh, we're going to open this up and people have questions. So, who has the mic? Tamara. So, if you could just please raise your hand. Tamara has a beautiful green scarf and she will bring you the microphone. If you could please tell us your name and uh, maybe who you're with or whatever, and just so we know who you are. I'm Kelly Boyd with myself. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. And my friends. Um, you mm. talked about sort of this culture of toxic masculinity and uh, more women being engaged allows us to be more caring, more open. Um, I, um, you guys also keep saying tribal and tribal has both good and bad connotations. Mm -hmm. uh, I recently read, uh, reread a book, uh, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, mm -hmm. uh, about a young man's memoir of his childhood in Malawi. And in Malawi, um, you know, everybody was poor, they were going through a famine. Uh, once the famine was over, people came in and were stealing from them, and he asked his father, should we punish them? And he said, if they're so desperate right. that they need to steal, of course not. Right. That's, that is tribal culture, yeah. um, where we take care of each other. So you're also mm -hmm. talked about mm. socialism. You used Good the point. bad word, yes. But mm. isn't that really what it is, is that we're a village and... and mm. Um, yeah. You know, are you looking to, to have us act more in that way, where we're yes. accepting of each other, where we yes. help each other, and we're not just trying to pull what's ours yes. out of something? Yes, I, that's, I love how you articulated that, because one of the things when we were talking about tribalism is I think, again, I, I mean, I'm simplifying this, but I, I do think when you have more balance, when, you, when women have more seats at the tables of power, you will see more of the positive tribalism, the care, you know, I'm going to take care of your kid and my kid. It's not just about my kid. I mean, this sort of individualistic thread that we have in American culture is quite dangerous and damaging. A little bit's okay, but we need to elevate more of the sort of communal um, thread. And, and that's what we want to do. That's definitely what the administration wants to do and represents. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. By the way, welcome to Fair Oaks. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Wendy Green. I'm just an attorney in town. I'm here by myself. Um, wanted to see you last time you were here and I couldn't get tickets, so I was very excited I could get my ticket today. Big fan of your husband, huge fan of you. So I, I, say, that because my, I say that because my question might sound like I'm not a big fan, and so I want to I wanna make it clear that, that I am a big fan. So um, I think based on conversations that I've had with my colleagues and my friends and, and my people in my life, one of the mistakes we Democrats made in 2016 was that we sort of ignored what's going on in the middle of the country. That we kind of, us coastal folks, you know, we're the elite and we're this and we're that. And you mentioned earlier about how great our culture is here in California because we are diverse and we are accepting. And my question to you is, is there a way that we as Californians can reach out to folks in the middle of the country and kind of let them know that, look, just because we're so accepting over here doesn't mean we're ignoring you and it doesn't mean we're not paying attention mm -hmm. to what's happening to you? Because I think that's going to be the key for us to succeed in 2020. Yes, no, that's a good point. Um, 100 percent, there's a lot we can do. and. Um, one of my friends runs a nonprofit that is about bridging the divide. And I haven't spoken to her in a while, but um, when our film comes out, the idea is that we're going to try and do some work together. She actually, though, learned kind of the technique that they're utilizing through a conservative church. And she sort of embedded herself in the church and learned how they basically brought people into their community, but again, it was it was a um, uh, um, a bit of the kind of conservative agenda th through line, and you you've seen that like uh, 
you've seen that with the Mormon Church, you've seen it with um, Catholic charities overseas, and, and, and not, not trying to be critical in any way, but I think that my point being that I, there are best practices for engaging, and again, it really comes down to, I think, reaching out a hand and breaking bread and talking about what we have in common or how we can work together to create a better future for all of us, not just the coastal sections of the country. Um, so I am optimistic and I think, but I guess, I guess the reason I brought up the, and I'm being very vague, I apologize, but I do think the conservative movement is a little bit more organized and have done a better job historically and a lot of it's been through the church or it's been through major donors like the Koch brothers, but in terms of galvanizing their community um, around particular issues and again, using fear to, um, to kind of Mo move their- to, Mobilize. To mobilize, right? right? Mm -hmm. And I, and I, and, and I do think the progressive movement I think things are shifting, and I think it helps having more women in leadership and more diversity in leadership, but I think the progressive movement has not done as great of a job of coming together, and I think that's, I think the beauty of now and why I have so much hope is because I think what happened, I think Trump, again, being that mirror reflecting back to us our cultural values and us going, whoa, we don't like that, has forced us to recognize that we all have to work together, and so I think that we are working together better than we were historically, but we still have a long ways to go when it comes to women of all stripes recognizing that we um, have to have the backs of, you know, this community, the black community, the immigrant community, blah, 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 blah. So I, I guess I'm just trying to say, like, we. I have hope because I feel that way. I'm leading with partnership and like we're in this together and I think others do, but we have a ways to go and we have to be smarter about it and we have to be, um, we have to not eat our own. <laughs> hmm. You know, I mean, I don't know what else to say. I just think that we could learn from them because they are ruthless in their strate strategy of mobilizing around issues and utilizing fear, which, I mean, you probably know this better than me, those of you who are, if there are any neuroscientists in the room, but that like it shifts, you know, your, your um, there's a difference, there's that my husband was, I've been like looking for this study, but some of you may have read about this, there's a study that came out that talks about the difference in the conservative brain versus the more liberal brain. And it's pretty, unfortunately, the, the it, it, it won't give you hope, <laughs> but I have hope because I do, I believe in plasticity, even if like they say our plasticity sort of neuroplasticity kind of is like stops when you're in your late 20s, but I do believe, you know, we may not be able to get my father over to the other side, but we, we can create bridges. Um, it just takes work and focus and partnering not being separate, which there's too much separation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, a lot of questions. Karen, where were you? Okay, over here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Trey Borden. I'm an arts producer. I actually met you and your husband at our booth at the convention with Planned Parenthood. Great. Uh, shout out to Crystal. Um, I have a question concerning Me Too, more so about kind of how it's framed and how we can move forward. So I was at a We Said Enough event a few weeks ago in San Francisco. As you know, that's the organization that emerged from the um, open letter detailing the culture of abuse at the Capitol. And um, they got together six of these silence breakers for a panel. And the question of rehabilitation of some of these bad actors came up. And there was an excellent response from uh, Dr. Celeste Kidd, who's a brain and cognitive scientist that were formerly at University of Rochester. And she said that before we start talking about, you know, how to save these guys from like Molester Island or we're sending these guys, uh, which is funny, I want to talk about all the women who've been pushed out of academia, have been pushed out of media, have been pushed out of politics, been pushed out of science. Let's um, get to the question. So the question is kind of what kind of reparations or how can you as, you know, the first partner kind of go back and for women who've been kind of historically abused, kind of bring them back into the fold as opposed to framing it around these bad men? Well, let me, 
to be clear that the I want to support the legislative agenda and my husband's agenda and continue the work that I care most about, which is really about um, elevating women, ensuring women's representation is you know fair and equitable across all industries, right? So I think whatever we can do, if it's specific to um, overcoming you know barriers related to sexual harassment in certain industries, um, whether it's addressing the pay gap or the wealth gap in certain industry, whatever it is, like I, I know that once we have more women with and more diverse communities at the tables of power across every industry, that you're gonna see a shift, it's gonna be a healthy shift. And it's not a threat to the men who are in power, it's more just a the company, the industry, whatever it is, is gonna be better off. I mean, all the studies indicate that the more diversity you have in leadership, the cre better the creativity, the productivity, and the better bottom line. So we wanna see that, right? So I, I, I'm like firm believer in just elevate, and elevate women's voices, elevate diverse voices, create space for them, um, and you'll start to see that cultural shift and you'll start to see policy shifts as well. So we could go on forever, but I know there Should are. Do one last question. Uh, I, sure. One last question. Sure. Okay. Gosh. Yes. Right. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'll do one last question, and um, I know people are going to stay and talk for a long time. <laughs> Good evening. First and foremost, thank you for leading with empathy. Yeah. I think oh. All too often we hear about leading from fear. Um, homelessness is a hot topic. Yes. Um, today. Um, we learned in the most recent report that 70% or youth and families experiencing homelessness has increased 70% over the last decade. And in fact, we have 1.6 million kids in our public school system hidden in plain sight that are experiencing homelessness. And when you talk about the discussions and who's at the table, I found being deep in that work, the kids' voices aren't represented. Mm -hmm. So I just was seeking advice. Where do we start to make sure the kids are represented as well? That's a great question. Um, I think we have to give them representation and seats at the tables of power. I mean, I think like one of the things we want to do, we've just, you know, we're opening the, the mansion up um, to the public and we're going to have a community garden and we want to have more events where there are engagements and you're just giving me some ideas right here, which is um, I, I wanted to, and on Friday, tomorrow, we're, we're doing an event with um, girls um, in honor of Women's History Month and International Women's Day, um, really celebrating girls that are vulnerable and, and um, have, um, um, you know, weren't necessarily um, born and first, you know, at the home plate. Um, and I think that you're just giving me some ideas that, you know, there's more we can do with homeless youth. Um, so I appreciate that and I'm going to kind of mull that over and I would love more ideas on your end, but that's a great, um, it's something that I care tremendously about and I know that uh, these kids did not choose to be born homeless or, um, and that we owe it to them to ensure that they get the best shot at having a great life and fulfilling their human potential. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah. So um, this is, um, a great eve of International Women's Day. Thank you for spending with us, Jennifer Siebel Newsom, first partner of California. Um, it's been great. Thank uh, you thank very you much.